Is Carrie on or Candace? Good morning, Carrie here. I'll text you the uh, list the right now. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. I'm ready to go. All right. Okay, I think we're live and recording. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Wu. It's been a long day already. And I am the chair of the City Council's Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. Um, I am really excited to be here for a hearing on this important topic, um, sponsored by my colleagues, Councillor Kenzie Bach and Councillor Matt O'Malley. Uh, this is a hearing on docket number 0941, um, order for a hearing on 100%, or, sorry, zoning relief for 100% affordable and deeply affordable housing. Um, we have many, many speakers and many, many counselors here. So I'm going to um, just do some quick housekeeping notes, then kick it over to the two co-sponsors for a, um, an opening statement of the length of their choosing, and then everyone else maybe on, on the council, a quick word uh, but if you could keep it to just about 30 seconds, that would be wonderful and appreciated. Um, so just to remind everyone, this hearing is being recorded and broadcast live on Zoom and the City Council YouTube page, um, as well as streaming on the City of Boston's uh, website and will be rebroadcast later on public cable access TV. Um, if you are watching this and wish to testify at this moment, you could email michelle.goldberg at boston.gov, and we can get you the Zoom link. Uh, public testimony will be after panel presentations. Okay, uh, so at this point, I'll hand it over to the lead sponsor, Councillor Kenzie Bach, um, and followed next by Councillor Matt O'Malley. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us today. I'm really excited to hear both from our administration here in the city of Boston um, and some fantastic advocates uh, and folks working in the trenches of affordable housing. Um, and then uh, from some of our friends across the river uh, about um, things, work that they have done already um, and are in the process of doing uh, that we could possibly uh, emulate here in Boston. Um, as folks know, uh, I've come to the work of the council through work on affordable housing um, and the thing that has struck me time and time again in that context is that our challenges around affordability are so big and we need such a significant pipeline of affordable housing to be both created and preserved um, that uh, when affordable housing projects die through death by a thousand cuts, it's just very discouraging um, because we really need to be moving uh, so much in the opposite direction. Um, and I think that uh, often we don't zoom out far enough to recognize all the ways in which um, we can make these projects uh, slow to the point that they don't happen at all. Um, so uh, this hearing was really galvanized um, by a project in Councillor O'Malley's district and I'll let him speak to that. Um, but I think the reason you know we're doing it together is because that project is really just evocative of an overall um, theme both here in our city and across the region. Um, and so I think that as we, um, as elected officials, we go to the ribbon cuttings for affordable housing, we celebrate when it happens. I think we need to look at the tools and the systems that enable it to happen more or less often. Um, and, uh, and our zoning is one of those systems. Um, and I think there are some really great ways that we could think about as a city uh, smoothing um, the zoning, uh, the planning and development process within our zoning um, restrictions for 100% affordable um, and deeply affordable projects. Uh, and I think that this is a critical piece of the puzzle for how we make sure that we don't end up with a Boston that only people with money get to live in. Uh, and I think that you know, when you look, there are cities in this country, San Francisco is probably 10 years ahead of us on that path. Um, some are five, you look at cities like London and Vancouver, um, where low income people have really ceased to be able to live in the city. We're proud to have that 20% of uh, affordable deed restricted housing in the city of Boston. Um, but we've got to figure out how to make more and not just to make more housing, but to make more deeply affordable housing. Um, so I'm excited to see what we and the administration could do in partnership and uh, how we can learn again from our neighbors. I'm really honored that we'll be joined by some other elected officials today uh, from those neighboring communities. Uh, and I just want to thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, holding this hearing and my uh, colleague, Councillor O'Malley, for co-sponsoring it. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Councillor O'Malley. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for holding this uh, important, holding this hearing and helping facilitate this incredibly vital discussion. Thank you, of course, to my dear colleague and friend, the District Counsel from Beacon Hill, Counselor Bach, for her leadership on all issues as it relates to housing uh, long before she was elected. And certainly it's it's been uh, the hallmark of her career thus far. I'm looking forward to seeing the work continue. Um, I don't need to tell anyone on the Zoom call that we've reached a point in Boston where half of renters are classified as rent burden, meaning that they spend more than 30% of their income on housing costs. This number will only grow by leaps and bounds as we begin to feel the economic impacts of COVID. Um, and we've seen firsthand already how the pandemic has worsened housing stability from displacement to eviction across the city of Boston and across the region. We know that thousands of families are on waiting lists from BHA and CDCs at every single block of this city and every single neighborhood rather of this city, we're seeing this. And the action is needed now. It is absolutely imperative that we're able to vastly and quickly increase our stock of deeply affordable housing units. Now, one of the obstacles that we often have to this um, are the regulatory barriers. We all know that. We know what a uh, robust and laborious um, community process can look like. All of us have lived through them. I've been on this body for 10 years. I've lived through more than, more than your average bear. But um, it, while it's an important part, sadly, we've often seen that very process uh, being used to further prevent the creation of any housing, but particularly deeply affordable housing as was mentioned, and, and it is important to note, there was a project, there is a project scheduled for Washington Street, Jamaica Plain. It was as positive and as universally appreciated and supported as any as I have seen in my decade on this body. And yet, someone who does not even live in the neighborhood or the city, but happens to own property that is close to this, a, a, a commercial enterprise that is, an empty commercial enterprise in many cases, but there's some commercial as well, um, was able to use the process in such a way to delay it. And that is keeping uh, a significant number of deeply affordable units at bay when we need them now more than ever. And I think it speaks to the fact that we need to fix the system here. We need strategic comprehensive zoning relief so that it's easier to build deeply this kind of housing. This is a time for creative ideas when it comes to affordability. Many of the approaches that are being piloted in other cities attempt to provide carrots rather than sticks. The goal here is to make affordable development easy and attractive to developers, as well as standardizing the process so that there is less friction and less reinventing of the wheel. We not only need a dramatic increase in supply to realign our housing market, we can also do affordable more intelligently by incorporating mix, mixed income developments, urban design best practices, as well as prioritizing transit oriented development. This is incredibly important conversation to have. I am hopeful that from this we'll be able to actually put some real policies and procedures in place that will codify both the zoning code, the zoning commission, uh, as well as BPDA overview. This is a very important conversation. The timing has never been more uh, vital than it is right now. And I'm delighted to get to work with uh, each and every one of you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Malley. Um, okay, now we'll go to each of our colleagues, uh, the folks who weren't the lead sponsors for a quick, quick statement if possible, because we do have three panels and the order will be Flynn, Mejia, Campbell, and Brayden. All right, Councillor Ed Flynn. Thank you, thank you, Councilor. Well, I just want to say thank you to Councilor Bach and Councilor O'Malley for their many years of um, support of affordable housing across our city. Um, great to have strong leaders like O'Malley and Bach and um, in working with the residents across the city. I have further comments, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ho uh, hold off, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Councilor Mejia. Yes, good morning. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I have really bad internet. But I, I'm here for all of this. I wanted to just thank my, co, uh, my colleagues and the sponsors of this hearing. Looking forward to having a conversation about the um, affordable housing situation that we find ourselves in. And while this may not be the um, appropriate public hearing to discuss, but you know, I think it would be important at some point for us to really define what affordable is and affordable to who. Um, and what that looks like um, in the city of Boston. But looking forward to this conversation and to being all in. Um, thank you, Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley for your leadership in this space. 
Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Councilor Bach and Council O'Malley for bringing this forward. It's a it's a great idea. Um, looking forward to the conversation. Thank you to all of the panelists for also being here this morning. Um, I, I think you know the the co-sponsors uh, summed it up well that you know obviously every single day as a district council, this is an issue that comes up in terms of affordability and access to affordable units. So anything that cuts at the red tape and bureaucracy uh, to get it done more quickly, to make units more uh, available more, uh, more swiftly for residents, I think is a good thing. So looking forward to the conversation. Thank you and um, thank you again to the sponsors. Thank you, Councilor Campbell. Councilor Braden. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, I also want to echo uh, my thanks and appreciation for the leadership of uh, Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley on this issue. Um, I, I've talked of it many times. We have a, a wait list in Alston Brighton of 17,000 folks waiting for affordable um, uh, income restricted housing. We are building thousands and thousands of units in Alston Brighton and most of it is uh, the income restricted part of that is usually above 70% of the area median income, which means that most people in live in Alston Brighton can't afford to live in those income restricted homes. So uh, I, this is an issue that's really near and dear to my heart and I look forward to hearing the panelists and, and thank you for um, uh, sharing this uh, hearing this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. And I also see Councillor Arroyo. Uh, just really quickly, I think uh, everything that has to be said has been said. We all know how important affordable housing is. And so I, I'd like to just get to the hearing. So thank you the, to the makers for this important hearing uh, on a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arroyo. Okay, um, I'm informed that there are no folks signed up for public testimony yet. So um, we would have given some space for, for folks to dive in ahead of time, but we'll, we'll go straight to the panel in that case. Panel number one is... Um, a folk, uh, representation from the administration. So I know we have a number of folks here. I see Brian Glasscock, uh, Christy D, um, Jessica Boatwright, and Michelle McCarthy and Tim Davis. So I, I'm not quite sure if you all have coordinated what order you'd like to go in, but if you could, whoever has an opening statement, if you could just introduce yourself, your role and um, keep it to just a few minutes, that would be appreciated. And then we'll go into Q and A with all the counselors. Thank you, Chairperson Wu, Councillors Bach, O'Malley, Flynn, Mejia, Campbell, Braden, and Arroyo for your attendance and your interest in this topic today. For the record, I am Tim Davis, Deputy Director for Policy Development and Research at the Department of Neighborhood Development. And I am joined here today by Jessica Boatwright, Deputy Director for Neighborhood Housing Development. Thank you for holding this hearing on this important topic. The Department of Neighborhood Development provides funding for the construction of new affordable income restricted housing as well as the preservation of existing income restricted housing. We are always looking for ways to reduce the costs and speed up the development of these units. For this reason, we are interested in the path the City of Cambridge has taken, which has the potential to lower permitting costs for some projects and also provide opportunities for income restricted uh, developers, developers of income restricted housing to better compete in a high cost market. Uh, we are interested in having this discussion in Boston and look forward to working with our zoning and planning partners at the Boston Planning Development Agency who will follow me and hearing the thoughts of the city council and the public today. Thank you and I will pass this over to the Boston Planning Development Agency. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for having us here today, Chairwoman Wu, Councillors Bach and O'Malley, uh, and everyone else who's here to talk about this important issue. I'm Michelle McCarthy, BBTA Housing Policy Manager for about the past two months now. Um, extremely excited to hear about uh, what the council envisions for 100% affordable housing overlay or deeply affordable housing zoning overlay. Um, and really interested to hear how we at the BBDA can assist and adapt ideas from other communities and work creatively on this extremely important issue. Uh, affordable housing and deeply affordable housing is a passion of mine. So I'm looking forward uh, very much to take this on uh, as I start here at the BBDA and look forward to um, just hearing from the community about, about ideas that uh, have worked in other, other cities and towns. So thank you so much.
Thank you. Do any of the other administration folks wish to jump in? I see Brian and Christy on as well. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, but I'm I'm definitely all ears right now. I'm like Michelle. I I want to hear some. You know what's the what's the best uh, best practices out there, and are they you know are they things that we can adapt to uh, the city of Boston? Thank you very much, Christy. Am I correct that you're here representing the Boston Housing Authority? You're mute. You're muted. Oh. Okay, we're having some trouble hearing. It looks like there might be some technical difficulties, but we'll we'll loop Christy back in um, if they wish later. So um, thank you very much to folks from D and D and the BPDA for your comments. We'll dive in with um, councilors' questions, starting with lead sponsor, Councilor Kenzie Bach. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Yeah, and thanks so much to um, both teams for being here today. I mean, I think we're gonna, um, you know, our next panel, we're gonna hear from advocates about things that would be helpful. Um, and and as I mentioned at this top, we've got, uh, you know, um, folks from Cambridge and Somerville coming to talk about their overlays. I guess um, one question I would have, and maybe it's best directed to Brian, is sort of um, what, what examples, if any, we have in Boston of applying an overlay type mechanism? I mean, I know we ha don't have one for affordability, um, but thinking about something um, that would try to ease the permitting process across the board for 100% um, affordable buildings. Uh, I just know that we, you know, we hear a lot of frustration um, from residents about why we can't get more deeply affordable uh, buildings and units built in the city. Um, and again and again, it comes back to issues of cost. And, and I think there are places where uh, the permitting, the time that we lose in the um, process uh, could really make the difference. Um, so I'm just curious whether, I know that we don't have an existing affordable housing overlay in the city, that's why we're having this hearing, um, but whether uh, on the zoning side, there's anything kind of um, kindred that we've done in the past in Boston that you can think of. Well, um, <clears throat> generally speaking, I don't want to dive too deep into, into zoning just yet, because as, as you know, that could be a kind of a rabbit hole. Uh, but uh, zoning overlays are generally used for, um, you know, I think probably the thing people are most familiar with is the interim planning overlay district. Uh, so it's a temporary overlay that sort of freezes things in time as we're doing a planning process. So as we develop new actual um, hard zoning, uh, you know, there's not sort of a fire sale on people trying to develop things really quickly before the new zoning kicks in. Um, but other overlays, uh, green, uh, green space overlay district, um, it's areas that, uh, an overlay is used for things where ordinary property lines and street grids uh, are not, uh, you know, not the best a way of, of defining a geographic area. Um, so in the case of, of of 100% affordable, for instance. Um, that's something that, that comes up in uh, neighborhoods across the city. It's an, it's an issue. It, there's demand, certainly demand for it in every neighborhood. Um, so to have an overlay, it seems like maybe that's either you have an overlay for the entire city or we, or we amend the actual zoning uh, in every neighborhood citywide. Um, to make uh, you know make that an unallowed use, treat it as a use, and I think that's what um, I'm going to defer to my colleague uh, Michelle and other folks that are going to talk about what's going on in Cambridge. But it seems like that's sort of the the upshot of that is uh, defining 100% affordable as a separate use category and then saying it's allowed, um, so it doesn't need zoning relief and it can be built as of right, and that's that's a a different. Um, and I think much more direct way of, of uh, you know, getting at that issue. I, I'm, I'd have to know more about what you're contemplating as an overlay to figure out how to, to streamline the, the, the process more. I mean, if I can drill down just a little bit more on that, uh, if the intent is to make 100% uh, affordable projects um, free from the threat of challenge by abutters, for instance, uh, then making it an allowed use uh, and uh, uh, 
making it so that uh, no zoning relief is required at all, uh, that's the most direct uh, direct approach to that. Um, and just one question for DND. I was wondering, um, I don't know if it's Jessica or Tim, but just if you guys could speak about, obviously, um, obviously DND puts money into lots of affordable housing projects around the city. Um, and I'm curious if you could just speak to how, how often you see, um, you know, delays and even projects dying um, because of, because of issues around, around um, zoning and permitting. So um, currently we are seeing about one project a year that is having these problems, but then those projects may be delayed significantly because of the zoning issues. Um, they can come in a couple of different formats. They are usually a butter lawsuits, um, which was the case, which is obviously the case in the Pine Street Community Builders Project on Washington Street. Um, it was also um, the butter repeal on a Parker Terrace Street and at the 15 Knot Street or residences at Paramount Station. Um, we also have had you know, issues with uh, situations where there's a problem with the boundary line um, and also one downtown where there is a, there's an issue within what we call a planned development area, PDA, that's a unique case. But I think that by and large, the butter lawsuits are the largest issue. But again, it's about one project per year. But every project that gets delayed is, is important to us, especially with the Pine Street project, given that the, uh, the vulnerable population it intends to serve and the really important need for that. And if Jessica would like to add anything, that would be, that would be fine. She's shaking her that head. Was a, that was a great summary. Thank you. Happy to talk about any of those specifically, but I think about one a year is, is right. Great, thanks so much. I'm mindful of our other panels, and so I'll, I, I'll I see my questions at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'm going to follow up on that. So, so uh, Tim and, and Jessica, you said it's about what one lawsuit a year, and do you know even anecdotally what the uh, success rate of those lawsuits that are filed or? I, I'm not a lawyer, but I think I'm smart enough to know the answer to the question that I'm asking, which they eventually are, are settled and, and the, the construction is eventually built by and large. I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of a scenario where one of these lawsuits, many of which I would characterize as completely frivolous, um, have stopped a project, but it has caused major, major delays. And to your point, it's, it's prevented people, a vulnerable population during pandemic from having access to housing. So that's one of the reasons why I think the action that this body and the city should take um, is desperately needed. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should get rid of the community process for all its lumps and bumps. I support the community process. But what I do think is that we have a uh, broken process in many ways where you can have people use this, this process to stop progress, um, to stop development, to stop something that has is again just universally uh, supported throughout throughout the uh, throughout the neighborhood throughout the city. So going back to Brian's question uh, point about sort of a, a city wide overlay or versus um, you know amend the zoning code to look at something like this. Just this is some what of an intellectual exercise right now. I wonder what that would look like. Have we done that with any other um, sort of changes? Admittedly, the, the zoning code is, is um, I think, needs significant um, reworking and, and overhauling, I'd even say, but it's something that we've had for many, many years. Have we seen something that uh, has been applied to every neighborhood to make building easier, sort of in your time um, or beyond? I'm thinking sure. maybe some environmental regulations, perhaps. Well, it's even more sort of basic than that. I mean, we uh, uh, we made things like art galleries and bakeries and um, you know repair shops and so on. <clears throat> it used to be conditional uses in business districts. Made those allowed citywide in a sort of an omnibus uh, change to zoning uh, to 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 free that up because there's you know there's no reason that um, a coffee shop going into a business district should need to go through. The, the ZBA process, that's what business districts are for. And so sort of removing those things that are more commonsensical, uh, you know, has, has worked fairly well. Um, you know, I think the <clears throat> other ways of streamlining, um, having a separate ZBA process for small businesses uh, has, has worked well. That Thursday night uh, subcommittee for 
um, homeowner projects and small businesses has opened the door for lots and lots of, of people that just couldn't, you know, if they got in the ZBAQ that they're, you know, they're going to wait, you know, six months to get, to get heard on something. I think that, uh, you know, that, that went a long way. Uh, this is a little, a little broader than that. Um, uh, you know, not, we don't know what the parameters, I guess, right now would be for a 100% affordable project. I think um, I'm intrigued by what you're uh, talking about as the community process. I'm not sure what the community process would be. If somebody came in proposing, um, you know, a 200 unit, 100% uh, affordable, uh, you know, 15 story building uh, in, in a neighborhood. Um, doing that as of right, I, I think would, um, uh, would be very difficult from a community process uh, point of view. I'm not sure how the, the abutters would, uh, how we would engage with the community, uh, in a meaningful way so that their input could actually shape the project. If it's already as of right, they, you know, theoretically the developer doesn't need anything. Uh, maybe some design review, but um, I'm not sure how we created a, a forum for a, a give and take with the with the neighborhood and the developers and the advocates, um, so that we can figure out what's the what's the right thing. Where, how do we arrive at the right sort of height and density and all those other things um, on a neighborhood? I, I don't I don't disagree with with anything you said, Brian, and, and certainly. For, for, for all of its issues, and there are many, the zoning code does serve a purpose in this city. Um, I certainly agree with that. I think though that we we have seen flaws exposed in it and this is one of them. So to answer yeah. your question, um, looking, and, and we will get to this with our neighbors in, in Cambridge and Somerville, uh, they've done some really innovative work in this space in Austin, Texas um, that you know I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some more information, but there are certainly incentives that we can offer to make it easier and more encouraging because I think another byproduct of this is that when you have a CDC or a nonprofit or a for-profit company working together to try to build uh, in Boston, as we all know, it is can be prohibitively uh, expensive for the first place uh, to add that with uh, affordable housing or deeply affordable housing, he or she may be less likely to do that if we're going to allow for this system where one individual can can stop a project that, again, has been years in the making. And we're all on the same page. I know the city was very instrumental in supporting this. Um, I was, uh, I think, believe all my at-large colleagues were. I mean, this is something that, that was really uh, just incredibly supported. And it's just, I think, speaks to um, a deficit in what our, our process is. I'm not saying we should throw everything out. I've said that several times, but I think your point is right. This is this is something that is going to take some some thought and some care and deliberation. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing more from advocates and our neighbors in government to hear some more things. Um, before I close, I did want to thank uh, Tim, Michelle, and Brian uh, for joining me and wearing blue uh, checked or striped shirts today. We all got the memo this morning. So all it's right. great with all of you. So thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you again, Council Paul. Thank you, Councillor O'Malley. Oh, sorry, I just yeah, didn't want to chime in. Yeah, I, I just want to, you know, touch on one last thing that Councillor O'Malley sort of mentioned, you know, and, and um, it would be wrong to not acknowledge the fact that, um, the, you know, the administration, the BPDA, and very importantly, uh, you know, this this body, the Boston City Council, uh, together submitted a home rule petition uh, that is still pending up at the state house that would um, authorize the, the city, empower the city of Boston to develop zoning uh, that uh, has inclusionary units uh, built into it. And I, I think that's really an important uh, piece of that. It would be, we believe it would be sort of a first in the nation, you know, pure inclusionary zoning without any strings attached where we could have uh, uh, as of right projects uh, be required to include inclusionary units and that would help um, I, I think um, immensely it's not going to solve everything and it's not going to solve problems uh, where there are dimensional limitations uh, and zoning relief is required but uh, it gets us past this point of having to keep things down zoned for the sole purpose of being able to ensure that the inclusionary uh, units happen and that that's a big piece and uh, you know we should we should all be you know proud of ourselves for actually getting that up there but now we we need to you know continue to push and, and get that passed thank you oh tim would you like to chime in 
Yes, and uh, just one quickly, uh, Councillor O'Malley had a pre had a as part of his question, he asked about projects that had actually been canceled because of the butter lawsuits. You're correct, Councillor O'Malley. There have not been any that we know of that have been canceled. Uh, they just delayed and they are eventually resolved. However, they do they that does cost money and time. Thank you. Can I, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I just I forgot one quick question that I just wanted to ask. I know my I already closed, but just very briefly, and this may be for you, Brian. Do we know what the status is on the zoning commission on uh, uh, adopting the rules set forth in the JP Rocks plan? Something that the community spent years uh, coming together with. I, I believe that we're waiting now for the zoning commission to formally ratify that. Can you just briefly tell us what the status is and when we can expect that vote to happen? Well, wow, that's, that's that's kind of a uh, that's a, that's a little bit of a tall order, but um, I can I can tell you this. Uh, and you're right, uh, there were a lot of of a um, uh, lot of hours and and blood, sweat, and tears spent on that. And I think the the JP Rocks plan itself, uh, you know, really was uh, sort of a turning point in how the city uh, has approached uh, planning and zoning. It was really um, sort of the dawning of a new age, and it's rough uh, as that. Uh, you know, that learning process might have been, came up with a really good plan. Uh, the problem is that we were still unable to get consensus around, um, you know, from the community around uh, actually implementing zoning to carry that out. So what's been happening in the, in the interim is projects have gone, uh, as projects have gone forward, uh, they've largely adopted the, um, uh, you know, the, the guidelines, the guidance that the planning document uh, presented, but they still need to go through, you know, that very, uh, rigorous uh, zoning relief uh, process through, through ZBA uh, process uh, in order to get to get built. And projects have, have gotten built. Could more of things have, have happened? Could we have um, uh, have uh, realized more affordable units had the zoning been in place? Maybe. Um, we are having those conversations with the with the community. We're 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 reengaging. We want to find out now five six years later. Um, what worked about the process and and uh, what didn't work? How can we do better in, in other neighborhoods? So we do uh, once we have a plan that that we've got consensus around. How do we turn that into actual zoning? So we're largely meeting the the, the goals of uh, Plan JP Rocks, uh, but the process to for projects to happen would be a lot easier if the zoning were in place and not the sort of nebulous uh, you know limbo that we're in right now. much. Okay, um, I want to recognize that Councillor Anissa Sapi george is present as well and um, note that Councillors Flynn and Arroyo have said they will defer their time uh, just to give more time for public testimony and, and others uh, panelists to have a say. I also want to recognize that they will be in a later panel so you will hear from them directly but thank you to our elected colleagues from uh, neighboring vicinities, Mayor, Cambridge Mayor Sumbul Siddiqui and Somerville Councillor Ben Ewan Campin for being with us and on the Zoom already. Um, okay, and so I had wanted to give the lead sponsors as much time as they needed to set the stage, but I am turning on the five minute clock for colleagues so we can keep going briskly. Um, it will be Councillor Mejia, then Councillor Campbell, Councillor Braden, and Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Mejia? So I'm gonna be really quick with my questions. I have five minutes. So I'm gonna expect those folks who are answering to be just as quick because I wanna get through all of this, okay, y'all? So I'm gonna put you on a timer as well. How about that? So Michelle, first, um, thank you for being here. I know that uh, a lot of folks who are watching, who are living these realities don't understand half the lingo that we're using. So if you could just, I know Councillor Bach mentioned something about overlays. Can you just really quickly define for us what an overlay is as simple and as quickly as possible? Sure, so an overlay is uh, a, a, a scheme over which um, the city or sections of the city would have um, specific zoning rules um, with regard to whatever is being proposed. So in the instance of 100% affordable housing overlay, it would say that the default zoning rules exist, but then the overlay is kind of laid on top of that to say that, that in the instance uh, of affordable housing, a specific set of additional rules or uh, easement of those rules exist. But I think that Brian might be a better uh, expert to answer that question if that is not a sufficient answer for you, Councillor Mejia. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll take a quick 30 second uh, shot at it. So ordinarily we use overlays to um, where there's a particular issue that covers 
multiple zoning districts, you know, not based on sort of streets and wards and precincts and the usual lines that we draw on the map. Uh, so for instance, a, a, a greenway planning over, overlay district follows a green space as it um, goes through a number of different uh, other zoning subdistricts. And, and a, lot of, a lot of times it's measured as a distance back from the river, for instance, or a uh, distance from, from parks. So it's where those things sort of um, don't meet our, our governmental uh, lines in the sand. Good job, Ryan. Get A plus for that one. That was All right. Easy. Thank you. So I'm moving on to Tim. Tim, you know, I'm just curious about uh, just zoning for, not just about zoning for affordable housing, but in, in zoning in, in the way that we might be potentially be able to build wealth as well. We've been working on projects around residential kitchens, and zoning for things like barbershops and hair salons to be operated out of people's homes. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the zoning roadblocks that may be in the way of something like that? I'm not sure I can be super helpful with that. Um, it's not my area of expertise. Again, Brian, maybe you can be more helpful on this question. Oh, Ryan is the dope guy today. Go ahead, I Ryan. know, sorry, Brian. Brian. You know, uh, uh, that's okay. Um, so zoning hurdles that, that there, um, two ways that zone, zoning could be a hurdle for uh, developing housing. Um, first, it's the, it's the uh, dimensional uh, thing. And that's probably the, big, the not, biggest not, challenge. Not, not housing, I'm talking about specifically for at-home entrepreneurs. So um, hurdles for folks who may want to utilize their homes. Oh, okay. Um, so there are actually, there are provisions for, um, you know, at home businesses and it's really becomes kind of a gray area because part of the, part of the problem, we certainly want, wouldn't want somebody to have an at home body shop. That would be a problem if they're spray paint cars. Um, so the, uh, there's a provision for things like doctor's offices, um, uh, you know, at home lawyers, accountants, people can work from home. I think there's a real um, opportunity to maybe rethink that in the in in the work from home COVID era. Uh, we've managed to get along with it okay, but the quick and easy answer is if you're doing something from the home where it's not impacting your neighbors, you don't have cars lining up, you know, because you, you're delivering food to the curb from your house, probably okay. Um, that's an IS, a bit of an ISD question, and it is kind of a gray area. It's mm -hmm. not really well defined in the zoning in the zoning code. Okay, good job, Brian. Okay, so now I'm bouncing off of um, Councillor Bach's question, um, and I'm not sure to who this. Uh, I'm I apparently I'm going to be signed off of this account for some reason, but um, we're finding what um, you mentioned that there were uh, one case per year that gets pushed back, Tim, and we're finding these cases in the same neighborhoods, or are we are they occurring across the city? Um, and you may not be able to answer this, but I'm just curious to know what kind of legal aid the city currently provides for some of these low-income housing projects. So, um, yeah, that's five minutes there. So feel free to answer everyone. And then if it's okay, I know you must have right, more. Right, 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 right. Second round. So they're, they've been in all different neighborhoods, Jamaica mm -hmm. Plain, Mission Hill, Downtown, Hyde Park, <laughs> Dorchester. They've been in, they've been in different neighborhoods. Um, we don't provide direct uh, legal assistance. However, we do fund the projects. And so if there is a funding increase due to the, the timing, uh, then we often have to plug that hole in their budget based on the cost, the increased cost of the project overall. And I do just want to add that, you know, unfortunately, if we do have to plug a, a, a gap because because of either project delays or need for redesign or just time or um, or staff time or legal fees that you know those are dollars that otherwise would go to another affordable project. So it is a sort of net loss for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up was Councillor Campbell, but I'm not. I think she might have had to jump to another meeting. Um, and then after that was Councillor Braid, Councillor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the the one the one issue that seems to come up um, 
is you know the the concept of affordable housing i i'm a strong believer in in mixed income developments sorry somebody's mowing their lawn out here um i'm gonna step inside this is a disadvantage of being out being able to sit on your deck um this is better <laughs> sorry about this um the pushback that we have an overlay district in Brighton, I think, on Washington Street, where there's elderly housing on uh, 90, um, 90 Washington, no, 20 Washington and 30 Washington Street, uh, Brene Brith and uh, the Patricia White um, housing development, which is a BHA um, development. Um, one issue that we encounter is that it, 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 it's very frustrating that a developer, a for-profit developer can come along and, and get ex extensive zoning relief to build a lot of density in the neighborhood without giving us any affordability uh, in terms of the IDP, the inclusionary development policy, uh, minimal benefits. Um, and I think if, if maybe we, I know, I know Tim, you were working on, on revising the IDP uh, policy when you were over at, uh, at BH, uh, at, at the BBDA, but um, you know, I think having a, a, a IDP policy that is more inclusive and not like in, in Alston Brighton, we're sort of stuck until very recently, we've sort of been stuck on that 70% area median income level and uh, it's basic, basically, it's sort of like a, a proxy for redlining because low income people of color who uh, cannot afford to get into those, um, those units and we're not building enough of them anyway. So uh, I really feel that there's maybe a couple of ways to go with this that really re revising our IDP policy um, to make it more, um, diverse income restricted ranges might be another way to go at it as well. But I'm also very interested to hear what the folks from Cambridge and Somerville are, 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 have done. Thank you. That was more of a statement than a question. Uh, is the IDP review, revisions, uh, changes in the IDP policy uh, another tool, um, Tim? No, yes, it can be another tool. I, it's uh, obviously a very different question than the question of, of an affordable zoning overlay district. Um, the, uh, as you were well aware, uh, there is also a process going on to pass a zoning ordinance around affirmatively furthering fair housing. And through that process, there will be, uh, I think, significant opportunities for communities to ask developers to do uh, affordable units that are responsive to the community and responsive to the very questions you're asking in terms of, in terms of incomes and equity. Um, it's built into the review process under the Affirmatively Further, for Furthering Fair Housing Zoning Amendment. So in terms of an overlay district, like how, how large of an area would that be? Could it be a a specific like spot zoning situation or it, would it be um, how extensive would a, an overlay um, district uh, extend? I have no experience of this so I'm, I'm trying to find out how, what, what the implications are. Oh that might be a, that might be a question. I think that's a question panel. for I think that's a question for Brian. Or Brian. Brian you're, you're it today. You're the man of the moment. <laughs> Um, so thank you. Glad to sort of take a, take a crack at that. So um, zoning, the, the thing about an overlay is it's either you're either trying to uh, describe an area that doesn't follow uh, street grids or, you know, specific zoning sub districts where you can just sort of say, uh, you know, the uh, Cleary Square uh, neighborhood shopping district, for instance, in Hyde Park is a, you know, well defined discrete sort of uh, neighborhood. And for that, there's a whole set of zoning rules that go with that. You would just change the zoning rules for that particular subdistrict. And we do that all the time on a citywide basis. We list all the, all the neighborhoods and all the sections that we want to change all at once versus an overlay where we would say, you know, uh, uh, either uh, an entire neighborhood, uh, you know, of, of Hyde Park, or we would say anything, you know, within a hundred feet of the center line of Hyde Park Avenue 
would be covered by I'm an so overlay sorry. district. You can this response and, and you're going to take all the time you need, but just noting that five minutes is up. Yep. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, I, I think it's, um, there are a couple of ways of getting at this, and I don't think we, we should be hung up on overlay versus a zoning change, but I, I merely mentioned that, that, um, that it might be more direct. If, if we're going to make actual changes to zoning, creating an overlay can sometimes add a, a level of, of complexity and confusion. People have a hard time wrapping their heads around as, we're, as, as I am right now. So maybe a more direct change to the actual zoning itself might be a, might be a, a less complicated way uh, uh, and really build it you know, into the actual zoning rather than have something that sort of hovers over all the existing zoning. But you know, that's, that's, that's ends up being a problem for uh, a technical problem less than a, a substantive policy problem. It's more of a, you know, what's the right tool to get to where we want to go. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. My time's up. So I'll let yep. the next person ask their questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. The next person is Councillor Sabi George. Thank you, um, Councillor Wu, and thank everyone for being here. I look forward to the rest of the panel. So I just want to ask a quick question. I also tuned in a few minutes late, so I don't want to be repetitive. Um, do, do we look at all with um, these larger, more affordable projects? Do they do we ever look and analyze sort of the length of time it takes to go through the development process compared to other projects? And you know, is there ways to abbreviate or shorten that length of time because those affordable projects are so important to our communities? And then do we also ever look at the size of the units that are developed? Yeah, are they I'm I want to provide more affordable, deeply affordable housing, a family housing. I'm just curious if there's any analysis that you all do on that and how does that impact the timeline? So thank you for those questions. I, I think I can get most of them and then um, Tim may be able to fill in a little bit. I think that's a really interesting question about whether the projects take longer compared to market rate projects. Um, one thing that makes that a little bit challenging is that our larger affordable housing projects tend to need tax credits, which means they need to go into the statewide competition for funding. Um, so that often can cause some delay just because the state pipeline is so big. Um, the state's treated Boston very, very well the last few years, but, um, but still often projects need to wait. So uh, I would be totally willing to look into that a little bit with with some colleagues at BPDA and Tim may have a little bit more to say on that since he was, re since he is a BPDA to DND um, staff person. Um, but I do wanna comment on the unit size. We, we do try to balance out and promote a variety of unit sizes. We also ask for a lot of evidence of community engagement before we fund a project and then as time goes on, if things change, we always make sure that the project team has gone out to the neighborhood again. And so often some of the unit size decisions are heavily, or always I would say they're heavily informed by what the neighborhood is saying about what they're looking for in their community. But we do try to um, promote projects that, that provide larger units. We try to compare information about local waiting lists um, and demand. Uh, all our projects have to have a market study so we do um, try to take that into account and also appreciate that um, not every project allows for the opportunity for those larger unit types, but we especially emphasize it when neighborhoods are asking for that. And, and in terms of just following up on that, um, it, is, it is clear that project, affordable housing projects that require tax credits do take significantly longer than most market rate projects to get from kind of idea to, you know, shovel being put in the ground. I don't have any specific data right here, um, but there is also a situation where um, right now, given COVID-19 and the uncertainties in the marketplace, there are a lot of market rate projects that have not uh, started. And so we're in a, in a little window here where we may see that affordable projects because of their funding sources and their financing can actually may be able to move faster than some market rate projects in getting from approval and into the ground. 
Is there ever an opportunity to speed that process up, the, the parts that we can control on the city's side? Because it does take longer with the tax credits and those, you know, the state competitions and all that. Right. So we're looking at, so in addition to something like the zoning amendment, we are also thinking about ways in which um, we can um, maybe in some cases we should, if we reduce the number of funding sources for a project, then we're able to move a project more quickly. So for example, if it's all city sources plus um, an easier to get quote unquote mass housing, you know, financing, then we might be able to move quicker. But again, once a project is looking at what we call 9% tax credits, then uh, we have significant delays. And Jessica may be able to say more to that. Yeah, we, we have uh, made a couple of, of changes in the last couple of years, apologies. Um, we, um, first of all, we try to work with project teams as soon as they have an idea so that once they, you know, come in for funding, we've helped them understand what the city requirements are and, um, and how they can move more quickly. We also have been doing a lot of work on the design side to try to make sure that project teams um, do as much as they can to advance their designs but prior to applying to the state, which often makes them much more favorable for funding consideration. And we're exploring- Feel free oh, okay. to continue, but- uh, right, no, just, we, um, we work with partners who provide pre-development funding um, to, to try to help make sure, especially for smaller or newer developers, that they can access a flow of funds that they need to keep the projects moving. So, you know, we've, we're, we're trying to cut at it from multiple angles because there are so many moving pieces. Thank you very much. Okay, round two for colleagues, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I'd prefer, I, I know we have some great folks on the next couple of panels and I'd prefer to move along to that. Um, Thank you. Great. Administration colleagues may be able to stay to hear as well, but thanks. Wonderful. Councilor O'Malley, you feel the same way or would you, do you have something? You know, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your uh, work and partnership in this space. Great. Uh, Councilor Mejia, I know we had cut you off before your, your list was done. Do you want to ask more in round two? Councilor Mejia? Okay, we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Councilor Braden? Um, um, I have no further questions at this time. I, I can move back to the folks from uh, uh, the administration at another time if I have further questions. I'd like, I'm really anxious. I have a hard stop at 11.30, so I'd like to hear the folks from Cambridge and Somerville. Thank you. Great. And Councillor Sabi George? You're good. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the administration representatives here. Um, you're welcome to stay or, or um, keep it on in the background as well, or, or you know, go to your many other important things that you also have to do. Okay, panel two will be, let me just double check, um, around current zoning related barriers to building affordable housing and possible solutions. So we have some organizational leaders here with us. Okay, let's see. Carrie, can we do a quick switch over in terms of the panelists? I see Andy here, um, Molly, okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to go in the order that um, the sponsors offices gave to me as very detailed instructions, so helpfully. Um, so we'll start with Andy, then let's see, is Jesse here? Okay, hi, Jesse, um, then Molly, and then Amy. Hello, uh, so I should just go ahead. Yep, if you could okay. just introduce yourself, your role, and uh, maybe keep it to a, a two or three minute opening statement and we'll do Q&A as well. Great, uh, thank you all for inviting me here today. My name is Andy Waxman. I'm with the Community Builders or TCB. Um, in addition to being a resident of JP for about 20 years, I oversee TCB's real estate development work throughout New England. Um, while TCB is in 14 states in the District of Columbia, we got our start in Boston over 50 years ago, and our headquarters is here in Boston. As a nonprofit, TCB's mission is to build and sustain strong communities where all people can thrive. The core of our work is developing, owning, and managing affordable housing and improving the lives of the residents and the neighborhoods where we work. TCB is a large stakeholder throughout Boston. We own and manage 1,500 homes in Boston, the great majority of which are affordable. 
In the last 10 years, we've developed affordable and mixed income housing in Boston neighborhoods, including Alston, Chinatown, Dorchester, Roxbury, the South End, and JP. Our current development pipeline has about a thousand additional units in Boston. Most relevant to this hearing, we're the developer along with the Pine Street Inn of 3368 Washington Street in JP. As you know, the zoning approval for that project has been appealed, it is in appealed and we are in the middle of a zoning litigation. So I'm limited in the specifics I can discuss on that property. What I can say is that TCB appreciates a robust community process. Such a process can have at least two main elements. First, a neighborhood wide plan that sets parameters for future development. And second, an Article 80 process that involves project specific review. On 3368 Washington Street, as well as our other projects, our goal is to respect and engage with existing neighborhood plans, as well as with local stakeholders and various city agencies with jurisdiction over development. We typically start this engagement well before we file for Article 80 approval. On this and other buildings, we have made important changes to our proposals both before and during the Article 80 process. This feedback has made our projects better. Ideally, this process leads to a greater support for the project. This is what happened on 3368 Washington Street. Unfortunately, when the zoning code has not yet been updated to reflect more recent planning processes, obtaining zoning approval involves the uncertainty of obtaining zoning variances with the risk of litigation. It creates an opportunity for individuals to challenge even unanimous decisions of duly appointed boards set up to decide after community input. That in turn can lead to protracted settlement needs or litigation. If a project does face litigation, it can significantly slow down a project. It could require significant expenditures of time and money and can ultimately result in projects not moving forward. This is true even when a project conforms to local plans and even if it has broad neighborhood consensus. We support the idea of codifying local plans into the zoning code, and we especially support this for projects with a significant share of affordable housing. I don't need to tell anyone on this council that we have a crisis with too few affordable homes in Boston. Clearing away this hurdle to the development of more affordable housing is one important step to help solve this critical issue. In this specific case of 3368 Washington Street, if an, if an affordable housing overlay district or underlining zoning code changes were in place, allowing this project as of right, we would be even closer to celebrating a groundbreaking. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Jesse? Uh, thank you, Councillors. My name is Jesse Kansen Beninov, and I'm Senior Project Manager at B'nai B'rith Housing. We're a nonprofit affordable uh, housing developer uh, based in Brighton, uh, working in Boston and the Boston suburbs. I'm also uh, President of Abundant Housing Massachusetts, which is a new statewide pro-housing advocacy coalition. Um, I want to thank uh, the my district councilor, uh, Matt O'Malley, as well as Councilor Bach for bringing this to the agenda today. Um, I think this is an important uh, discussion. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity to be involved in the discussion around the affordable housing overlay over a number of years in Cambridge. Uh, and so I'm glad to see this uh, emerging um, in Boston. Um, we all agree there is an affordable housing crisis. We all agree we need more affordable homes in the city of Boston. We need to create a regulatory uh, scheme that allows affordable housing to be built. What I want to do here uh, in just a couple minutes is uh, go over some of the strategies that I believe uh, we need to, uh, to undertake in order to create the conditions whereby we can create an abundance of affordable homes throughout the city of Boston. Uh, B'nai B'rith Housing is a small um, affordable housing developer. Um, we and other small nonprofits like CDCs often find ourselves um, in Boston at a disadvantage in the competition for land. We can't bid as high as market rate developers as we face uh, a variety of challenges, including local and state caps on the development costs when competing for scarce public resources. Um, permitting costs and times are substantial in Boston. This means that uh, money goes towards uh, development soft costs like uh, lawyers um, and less towards the con actual construction of new affordable homes. It also means a much longer timeline, as Andy was talking about, uh, to bring these important critical homes uh, to fruition. Affordable housing is clearly a priority in Boston. It's a public good. We want to encourage it. So as I said at the beginning, the regulatory framework for affordable housing should be constructed to encourage this type of investment, not essentially to tax it and make it harder to build. 
when we look at regulatory relief for 100% uh, or substantially affordable housing projects in Boston, I would suggest there are two items we need to look at. That's the process and then the underlying zoning. We need to reform the process. I believe we should exempt 100% affordable housing development from uh, extensive community review processes like Article 80, large or small project review. Uh, when it comes to affordable housing development, research by Einstein, Glick, and Palmer at BU have shown that community processes in greater Boston are not representative of overall community opinion or need. If affordable housing is a priority for Boston, at least within certain parameters, we need to eliminate extensive, costly, long public reviews and comment period. But process alone is not enough. The underlying zoning in any zoning district should actually allow for the physical form of affordable housing to be built. Remember that, as talked about in the last panel, the largest affordable housing development program in the Commonwealth is the low-income housing tax credit program, which is used for multifamily construction. Dimensional requirements like height limits, lot setbacks, floor area ratios, and yes, parking can render projects infeasible on otherwise size effective parcels. Perhaps we're getting into the territory of the Zoning Commission at this point, but it's a critical element to have in any comprehensive discussion of this topic. I want to also just highlight again parking. If we want to build an equitable and green city, we need to reduce and eliminate reliance on cars and move people towards biking, trains, walking, and other forms of transportation. More than that, parking requirements are cumbersome to affordable housing. In areas with high parking ratios, affordable developments rarely see all parking utilized, and excessive parking requirements have a negative financial impact on project and hurt the feasibility of building new affordable homes. And finally, I want to stress that anything we do here should be citywide. This is a city investment. Affordable housing is a city investment. And every neighborhood has a role to play in contributing to this public good. The existence of single family zoning or other restrictive districts in a neighborhood should not alone preclude it from playing a role in addressing this need. I want to underscore that point. This should be citywide. I think we need to look to the example of, of Cambridge and Somerville um, who have taken this citywide and made it effective to every district. I'll leave it there and I look forward to answering questions um, after the, this panel. Thank you so much. Um, before we move on to Molly, I just want to flag that um, in consultation with the, the lead sponsor, uh, we are combining, we, we were originally going to give um, the cities of, of Cambridge and Somerville their own panel, but we're going to just combine it into one big conversation because I know my colleagues are eager to hear from the mayor and councillor as well. So after we go through Molly and Amy, then we'll also pass it to Mayor Siddiqui and Councillor Yu and Kempin and then do Q&A with everyone. Um, and also wanted to note that Councillor Campbell has um, been having some technical difficulties. So she's uh, present, I mean, watching, but we'll send questions along later. Okay, uh, Molly, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wu. I'll be quick because I'm here uh, representing Abundant Housing also. I'm the clerk and a founding board member. Um, I also work for Alston Brighton CDC as my day job. I run the home ownership and counseling programs. Um, and then for background, I also have um, a few developers in my family uh, in Jamaica Plain where uh, I live and I grew up. I think I have been a resident for my entire life besides the four years I was at UMass Amherst. Um, one thing I just wanted to add to all of Jesse's points is that uh, we're here we're talking about rental housing, much of the subsidized housing, um, the housing that's uh, the housing stock developed by the CDCs is subsidized rental housing. It is very difficult to do 100% uh, affordable home ownership projects today. I don't know of any that have been done without some market rate cross subsidy. So um, that is, we're not addressing the home ownership problem. And I think um, in terms of demand, it's skyrocketing. We've had thousands of people come through my home buying class in the last couple of years. Uh, and about 40% of those are making less than 80% AMI. So this is not just for people who are above the area median income. Um, a lot of people are interested in home ownership and we have the absolute best first time home buyer uh, loan programs in the country. Um, one mortgage is amazing. And the ideal situation is that somebody can use one mortgage with a market rate property. 
but we are not seeing market rate properties that can qualify for those loans. So um, the resources at our disposal are just being left on the table and it's disappointing, but I will leave it at that. Thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm gonna do a screen share for a quick presentation. Um, uh, hi, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about zoning for multifamily housing, which is what I spent a couple of years researching. I'm an independent policy researcher. I really appreciate everyone's attention to this topic and uh, specifically to affordable housing. Uh, I, my presentation is to give a little bit of big picture regional um, context for your discussion. Uh, Pre-pandemic, it was projected that Greater Boston needed hundreds of thousands of dwelling units to meet demand for housing. And so I looked at zoning for multifamily housing in 100 cities and towns of Greater Boston, not including the city of Boston itself. And I went through the zoning and housing production plans and master plans. And the main takeaway was that we don't have the zoning in place across the region to meet demand for housing. So thus the, the housing shortage we've seen. Um, I looked specifically at a lot more questions digging deeper, but one was where are we allowing um, for multifamily housing to be built across the region? Um, and my big takeaway was that municipalities are allowing incremental development in the historic centers, the downtowns, um, typically tens of units of development over a couple of decades, um, and then more on the municipal peripheries, on the edges between highways, train tracks, and water, um, and hardly any in the vast in-between, uh, which is uh, you know, the residential neighborhoods. The vast majority of Greater Boston is zoned for single-family housing, um, and uh, very little uh, zoning sort of allows for more multifamily housing in the vast areas of the region. Um, Greater Boston has so many historic downtowns, great places to live, um, and cities and towns have seen adding housing there as a strategy to keep them vital, and this may be even more important now as main streets and small businesses are hit during the pandemic. Um, uh, as an example, oh, and what I also wanted to say there is that we've seen great progress here um, that about half of the cities and towns that I looked at added housing to a historic center in the last two decades. And most of that involved um, rewriting the zoning to allow it. Uh, but as I was saying, it tended to be at a scale of tens of units um, and very sort of careful rezoning. So a parking lot will get rezoned or very specific properties um, get rezoned to allow more housing as opposed to a broad based up zoning. Um, and if you add up all of the dwelling units that have been added to all of the historic downtowns across Greater Boston in the last 20 years, it adds up to a very small portion of projected demand. Um, and then to a quick case study, Needham's got a historic downtown with a train, a white steeple church and lots of shops, a great place for housing. They started planning um, you know, 15 years ago, uh, 20 years ago for more housing in the downtown. Um, then in 2009, they rewrote the zoning um, to allow housing. Since then, we've seen 10 units developed in Needham Center. It's shown here in the picture. Um, and then on the map of Needham, you see those 10, cent, um, 10 units right in the middle. And then meanwhile, in the last few years, Needham allowed 52, permitted um, 52 units and 136 units right on the edge of town, right on Route 128. And then on the far side of Route 128 from the rest of Needham, 390 units. Um, and really nothing else has been allowed in terms of significant multifamily housing in the, the vast majority of Needham that's residential. Um, now, allowing more housing on the edges of town, something I've seen up and down Route 128 and all across Greater Boston, this isn't a bad thing if politically that's where it's acceptable to um, add more housing, we've needed that housing. And the question across the region there has been how do we create connected hubs um, on the edges that are similar to the centers. This is just the view from the top of that apartment building with 390 dwelling units on the far side 128 from the rest of Needham. Um, then the last thing, so I talked about the centers, the edges, there's a vast in between, and I think this is where um, 
the idea of an affordable housing overlay or whatever you'll call it is, is particularly relevant um, is that sort of all these residential neighborhoods have been the hardest politically to upzone. I saw it in just master plan after master plan, housing production plans, um, sentiments like Reading's preserve the town as primarily single family owner occupied residential community or Burlington's um, 2017 master plan. For any comprehensive housing policy to work in Burlington, it must begin with protecting the sound, town's single family neighborhoods from unwanted encroachment by other land uses. And the next sentence in the plan specifies that other land uses is multifamily housing. Um, so that's sort of just like a big contextual overview. Uh, you know, in my view, we should be allowing a lot more housing in the centers um, and around the centers and allow incrementally more housing and walking distance at the centers and biking distance at the centers. And that's getting really into that um, zoning and um, single family neighborhoods that's so hard to change. And then to plan connected um, nodes um, in on the edges that are diverse and walkable and have served by public transportation a little bit harder in the pandemic age, I think, uh, you know, mobilizing funding and planning and attention to those areas. Um, but yeah, that's that's my basic overview. Thank you. And I look forward to this discussion. And it's, I really appreciate hearing what everyone has to say on this topic. Thank you very much. That was really informative. Uh, Mayor Siddiqui. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'll try not to repeat uh, what's been said. So in Cambridge, um, what I'll say is uh, that for many, many years, this has been, uh, it had been talked about. Um, and I think uh, it all came down to the process. Uh, and so uh, the, it, and it took a while. So I'll start with uh, the, the reasons why many of us supported it. Uh, and those have been mentioned, but ultimately uh, our number one goal is to create um, and preserve affordable housing in the city. Uh, and we are in a ho housing affordability crisis. So we knew that with this overlay, it wouldn't solve all our problems, but it would help us at least uh, create some more units that were 100% affordable throughout the city um, because we have parts of the city that have more affordable housing than others. So I'll go back to equity um, and so forth. But it took a while. So the legislative process is something that, um, you know, there's a lot of learnings from. Uh, because it didn't just happen in one term. Uh, we had, this has been talked about since probably 2014, 2015. Uh, and finally, uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, we talked to our, our Cambridge Development Department uh, to come up with um, a, a zoning scheme. Uh, and after that, we had, I think, over a dozen uh, housing committee meetings. We had ordinance meetings. Uh, we had community meetings. Uh, there was a there was a lot of process uh, in between uh, to to getting uh, it to uh, to be discussed uh, by the council. Ultimately, uh, last term it didn't pass. Uh, what we decided to do was we tabled it uh, so it could come back. Uh, we didn't have the support on the council for the overlay, um, and I can get into some of the reasons why um, some of my colleagues at that time opposed it. Uh, and why there was um, there wasn't uh, there was a lot of loud voices who were in opposition to to the overlay, but ultimately it came back this term. We had the support for it. Uh, we had done so many meetings. We had a lot of process, um, and we had the, the the votes on the council to to pass it. Uh, but really, the the ultimate thing that the the challenges that we had were to the as of right permitting. Um, a lot of pushback um, to that. A lot of pushback to this notion of neighborhood character and changing neighborhood character. Uh, what would happen with height limits, setbacks, open open space requirements? This this really this huge worry that what we we're going to build um, would not fit in uh, to neighborhood character. And so uh, there are a lot of really tough, um, divisive decisions and, and and commentary that came out as a result of uh, of these discussions. Uh, and so ultimately. You know, there was there were amendment made. Uh, There's a lot of amendments that were made the first round, uh, but ultimately, because we didn't have the support, uh, we had to decide to table it. And this time around, uh, there was not there there wasn't as much uh, opposition to it. I think still people were fearful of what uh, these increased uh, density allowances uh, would do. Uh, but again, we the approach was 
this is what it'll look like. And so we did a lot of uh, showing uh, how this really wouldn't have a huge impact uh, on our neighbor in, on our neighborhoods. We're about six, seven miles, uh, and there's a for, there is affordable housing in most neighborhoods. Uh, so it was really doing that education part. Uh, and so that's some of the strategies our CDD department used. And so, you know, I think it's really important that we, we did, 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 did this. Uh, will, you know, we have an evaluation process built within the, the ordinance to, to see how we're doing and, and so forth. But uh, I think it's, it's a really good start. You know, how many units? will it ultimately build? Um, there, some critics are saying it's only going to do 100. And our, our response to that was, you know, that's 100 homes, right? And so whatever we can do uh, to create that opportunity for people, uh, we have to do. Uh, and we have such a track record from our affordable housing developers um, who make, you know, amazing buildings um, and do listen uh, to the community. So instead, in lieu of this binding, you know, uh, approval process, we have built into the process uh, a non-binding review. So, uh, you know, we we still wanted to have some design guidelines uh, and so forth. So there will still be somewhat of a process. But again, as you've heard throughout this presentation, um, this the goal is not to, it's to streamline it and not to hold up projects. And we had so many examples. And so we really really did that research. Of how many examples? Of affordable housing units um, where uh, buildings, uh, one, one of the examples I have is there was a 40 unit uh, building that was appealed, it delayed the project for three, almost three years. Uh, and a, a redesign happened and that resulted in the reduction of family size units and the loss of uh, additional units. So we don't want that. Uh, and, and so this will enable us uh, to have a more streamlined uh, process. So I'll stop there, happy to answer uh, specific questions. Thank you so much, Mayor. And um, Councilor Ewan Campen, would you close us out for this round? Certainly. Um, so thank you very much, Chairman Wu and Councilors for having me here today. This is very exciting. My name is Ben Ewan Campen. I'm the Ward 3 City Councilor at Somerville. Uh, so that's parts of Union Square, Prospect Hill, Spring Hill. I'm also the chair of our land use committee, uh, where we've been working for the past several months on a citywide affordable housing overlay. Um, the draft that we have us before us in Somerville uh, currently has the support of the land use committee and we'll be moving to the full council for a public hearing next week. Um, it has a lot in common with the proposal in Cambridge. Um, I've shared our current draft with Councillor Bach. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about it. Um, I think it's very fitting today that I'm speaking after Mayor, Mayor Siddiqui and so many of the advocates who were involved in the work in Cambridge, uh, because we in Somerville certainly learned a great deal from what, what was done there. Um, so I just want to start by being really clear about what an overlay means in this context for anyone who doesn't live deep in the weeds of zoning terminology. Uh, in Somerville, this overlay would mean that for every property in the city, if you're going to build standard market rate development, you're held to our basic zoning requirements, our, our base zoning. Um, but if you're going to build 100% affordable building, you get access to a different set of zoning rules. And these rules are designed to encourage the projects to move forward smoothly, to be more cost effective. And I'm going to get into those details in a minute. Um, but I, I want to outline our process of how we went around this. So we, we began by asking, what are the obstacles in our zoning um, to the creation of new affordable housing in Somerville? And the reasons that we focus on zoning specifically is because as we all know, there are so many issues, <laughs> uh, so many obstacles for building new affordable housing, but zoning is something that is within the control of the city council directly. Um, so we had our planning and our housing staff go out and conduct a, a number of interviews with developers, both nonprofit and market rate developers and ask them, what are the obstacles in our zoning when it comes to creating new affordable housing? We heard a lot of answers, but the, the two major issues that came up over and over were this. The price of land, this, this is obvious, but nonprofit developers, as, as we know, are out there, they're competing for the same properties that market rate developers are, um, which makes it exceptionally difficult to secure land because they don't get to turn around and make a profit. Um, the second issue is that when these developers are seeking funding, when they're, when they're lining up the funding sources for their projects, the thing that funders are really looking for is certainty around what will be allowed to be built, the timeline, the, the, the risk of years of lawsuits, as, as we've discussed. 
So the overlay that we've created tries to address both these issues. To deal with the issue of land costs, we offer density and height bonuses for 100% affordable buildings. So the allowable heights for affordable projects, they vary based on what the underlying zoning is. So to, to oversimplify it, if you're in a two to three story zone in Somerville, an affordable project could go up to three or four stories and there are no restrictions on the unit density within the, the building envelope. If you are in a four story, what we call mid-rise districts, you can go to seven stories. Um, and again, this is citywide. And the, the number seven for stories is actually, um, that was the result of a lot of feedback we heard from nonprofit developers who emphasized um, that in terms of the available funding and uh, the, the way that the construction process works, actually, this is an important sweet spot. Um, so now to deal with the issue of permitting, we removed the special permit that would otherwise be required for residential usage. So it essentially makes these projects by right. But uh, I wanna emphasize there is still a great deal of opportunity for community input on, on site plan, on aesthetics, on materials, um, but there is gr much, much greater certainty that the projects will ultimately be able to move forward in a reasonable time. So I am really excited to get this done in Somerville, but I, I also wanna emphasize, I actually view this proposal and the work we're doing as a, as a relatively modest step forward, um, really more of a floor than a ceiling for what local governments should be doing. Uh, the fundamental limiting factor around new affordable housing is funding. And this proposal doesn't address funding whatsoever. What we're trying to do at the local level is get out of the way <laughs> uh, for projects that do have the funding, that do have a path forward to make sure that uh, at the local level, we are not putting up any additional roadblocks. Um, so again, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'll wrap up there. Thank you very much for having me and for your work on this. Thank you very much. Um, I wanna recognize that Council President Kim Janey has been with us for some time as well. Um, and if colleagues will indulge, um, we have a familiar face here that I'm gonna to bump to speak um, as the first person to do public testimony before we go into Q&A. Councilor Zakem, right, welcome Madam, back. Madam Chair, thank you, uh, thank you for having me. I wanna uh, thank many of my former colleagues and, uh, and my uh, successor as District 8 Councilor uh, in bringing this important matter forward. It's certainly something that uh, we've spent a long time uh, working on both in the public and the private sector and particularly Councilors uh, Bach and O'Malley for this hearing order. Uh, it's timely, uh, it's on point, and it coincidentally um, goes well with my, my new endeavor that I'm working on, Housing Forward Massachusetts, uh, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to removing obstacles, regulatory obstacles to affordable housing, uh, workforce housing development across the Commonwealth. Obviously, uh, Boston is very important to us. And we've heard already throughout this hearing countless stories. Um, I experienced this quite a bit as a city councilor as a chair of our housing committee of good projects, uh, affordable projects, middle-income projects that were held up uh, through lawsuits, through arcane zoning procedures. Um, and that adds to the cost dramatically uh, in materials and carrying costs and the soft costs, which can often make up uh, between a fifth and a third uh, of a project's cost, sometimes even higher uh, for affordable developments. And it's incumbent upon cities and towns and quite frankly, the state of Massachusetts to remove some of these obstacles. Um, so I would say I agree with uh, many of the proposals and Housing Forward Mass has shared our sort of principles uh, around zoning that we believe in uh, with the panel um, that have been talked about today. Um, so we need some change at the state level, um, but the idea of making all affordable projects as of right in most areas makes a lot, a lot of sense, um, especially when we're talking about not uh, projects that aren't at high rise level. So when we're talking about, you know, five or six story projects um, that make sense in central business districts, in areas that are transit adjacent, um, we need to be doing this. Um, the process should not be this complicated. And quite frankly, I don't think, I don't think it's acceptable as a matter of public policy, uh, morality, or, or smart economic development to allow one individual a uh, butter to hold up what is otherwise a well-supported project that will solve a big problem uh, for the community. So some of the changes that we've, that have already been talked about in this hearing, I wholeheartedly agree with, as I said, making very low income, uh, other deed restricted projects as of right in most districts. Um, you know, quite frankly, 
in the absence of massive federal funding, uh, solving the affordable and workforce housing challenges is going to fall on cities and towns and states. And because we don't have a blank check the way the federal government does, uh, we need to be smart about reducing regulation. And, and Councilor Ewan Campen uh, was mentioning this uh, previously. We need to get out of the way, um, whether it's at the city or town level or at the statewide level. Um, so we're excited to see some movement on this, certainly in the Boston City Council, our colleagues in Cambridge and Somerville and at the State House. I'm happy to take any questions on the plans and proposals and goals of Housing Forward and how we can be helpful in doing this. Because not only do are we interested in developing and proposing model policy proposals, but we also want to help organize and make sure that these goals are achieved um, in city and town halls uh, and at the state house in Massachusetts. So I want to thank you uh, for your courtesy and letting me speak here. Councilor, this is not exactly the way I envisioned uh, my return to the council chamber uh, to be when we left uh, in, in January. Um, I do look forward to all of us being back uh, in that building again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zakem. Um, and there had been only one other person in the waiting room for public testimony. So, and and they've been waiting for a very long time. So, uh, Moira, if you're there, oh, are you still there? Actually, I think we might have lost her. Okay. Um, okay, then we'll just dive into Q and A, starting with Councilor Bach. Great, thank you so much, um, Madam Chair, and I'll end to Councilor Zakem, um, my predecessor. It's so great to see you here in this space and I'm glad to know about your um, your endeavor pushing this forward because I think we do I think I think it is absolutely right that this conversation today is about what we can do here in Boston and it is also true vis-a-vis -vis what you said and also um, what Amy Dane said in her presentation that we we need a level of partnership on creating affordability across the metro region and the Commonwealth um, that we don't always see from uh, our uh, neighboring municipalities. Um, and so, you know, we really need folks advocating for that. Um, but some neighboring municipalities that really are giving us a model here are Cambridge uh, and Somerville. And I really want to thank the mayor um, again for being with us and Councillor Ewan Campen. And just to say, I mean, I think that, uh, I think Mayor Siddiqui is underselling the, the process around the affordable housing overlay in Cambridge was very contentious. I followed it closely. Um, and her leadership was a big part of saying that this is something that the the city needed to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's funny sometimes when we're talking about inclusionary development and affordable housing, um, folks, you know, end up saying, well, I don't think we should do this because it's not, it does, it's not inclusionary enough. The ratio of affordable housing isn't too high, uh, isn't high enough. Um, and then when Cambridge was talking about 100% affordable housing, you had people sort of casting about for alternative arguments because of course it was all affordable. Um, and I think unfortunately that, uh, we we still sometimes fall prey to prejudices about what it means to have a really um, economically integrated community. Um, and I think anything we can do to push back against that is important. Um, and I, I, I do wanna say counselors have in their inbox, both the Cambridge um, legislation and the Somerville legislation. Um, and I think uh, I'm, I wanted to ask um, Ben, I, I saw in yours that you're sort of, um, you know, to the point that uh, that Mr. Glasscock raised earlier, it's not an across the board, if it's affordable, anything goes, but like you explained, you're sort of allowing a kind of equivalent bonus for every area, is that right? So it's sort of like if, um, if, I'm, a, if I'm a four story area, I might be able to get, well, I, I, up to five or six, right? And then, and, and so you're sort of doing a, great, a graded approach, is that a fair description? Yes, that, that's exactly right, Councillor. So, so the way that our zoning works in Somerville, we actually recently overhauled the entire city the way that our zoning works. And we have what's called neighborhood residence districts that are basically two, two and a half stories, urban residence districts that are up to three stories, and then mid-rise and high-rise districts that are three, four, five, six higher. And then the, the bonus that you would get for an affordable project scales with what the underlying zoning is. So it still matches the kind of citywide logic of kind of our, our strategic planning vision for the city. Great. No, and I think that's a thoughtful, it's a it's a thoughtful way of approaching it. And I noticed the same thing, Mayor Siddiqui, and in your in your um, legislation, it's sort of, you know, it's still taking into consideration the type of district that something is in. It's just trying to uh, to allow a little bit more um, a little bit more room for our affordable housing. And I, and I think it's important to note um, that people, 
people often don't realize, like when I walk through Cambridge, I see a lot of affordable housing that um, often doesn't look exactly like what's next to it, but totally fits into the neighborhood um, integrated uh, along the streetscape. And I think sometimes people forget that a lot of our affordable, um, both naturally and uh, funded affordable housing in our cities um, was created before some of our zoning strictures. So there's been a lot of attention lately, for instance, to the fact that triple deckers are not allowed by right by zone by Boston zoning in a lot of majority triple decker neighborhoods um, in our city. And so I, I think uh, sometimes we we let we let density be this um, this kind of imagined bugaboo that it really isn't um, in our lived experience. I wondered, uh, Mayor Siddiqui, if you could say just a little bit more about I think we're shamelessly aiming here in Boston to to learn from and benefit from your experience, which was a, a long and drawn out process in Cambridge and think about um, how, how you would build community consensus uh, for something along these lines um, more quickly. And so I'm just curious what, if you had known then what you know now, what are the things that you think um, are the biggest learnings from the process over there? I mean, the reality is that there will be uh, individuals who you just can't convince. Uh, and I think some of us, my colleagues who worked um, equally as hard on this, we thought that maybe if we explain certain things, um, there would be a change in, in thinking. Uh, so I think we really, we really tried doing that uh, for a while and then realized um, this won't have support um, from certain people in the neighborhood uh, because they don't want more density, right? You just, we just had to realize you can't um, change some of those um, those minds. I think something that was helpful that uh, we did do was, you know, I had hosted as a counselor a session with some neighborhood groups around what, um, you know, how do you fund affordable housing and what is affordable housing? Because people don't understand how hard it is to actually build affordable housing. Uh, and they weren't clear, um, uh, uh, you know, around all the many different income, the different funding streams uh, that are needed. And so uh, I don't think people knew the obstacles and the barriers. And so we were able to ex have someone come in um, and kind of explain and use some of the projects uh, and say, look, this took over 30 funding uh, streams, including from the city of Cambridge, uh, so I think that education helped. I think maybe perhaps uh, we should have done it earlier on in the process. Uh, so those are some things I think uh, really, uh, you know, our communities are pretty different. So I think it's hard to, but I think there will be the, the people who are really, really concerned about um, the, the neighborhood character piece. And so whatever you can do to show, um, you know, you know, the pictures and, 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 and uh, you know, show that this is actually, you know, not going to be um, these tall buildings. I don't have a problem with tall buildings. I grew up in affordable housing in Cambridge in, in some towers, uh, but people are like, oh, we're we gonna have another, you know, towers in our neighborhood. And that's not the case. So we had to, it was uncomfortable. We had to say, this is what it's actually going to be like. Uh, and some people were comforted by the fact that they were, um, they had images. So the images piece, I think, helped uh, as well, but it could have happened earlier on in the process when we were explaining uh, what we meant, because those, uh, those themes, those um, pictures and images came, a, you know, a little later in the process. So people had these images already in their mind. So whatever you can do to uh, work with your CDD, to work with your community department, to, to show what it actually looks like um, could go a long way in the beginning. Great, thank you. Um, I have more questions, but Madam Chair, I wanna be deferential to my colleagues, so I'll, I'll hold for now. Thank you. I'm trying not to be too harsh this round because we don't have any more panelists or, or public testimony and folks waiting. So, but just wanna have some consistency, counselor to counselor. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Molly, Jesse, Andy, we have worked incredibly well together on some really innovative and great projects, not only in Jamaica Plain, but in West Roxbury as well. Thank you for your 
great leadership. Um, Amy, I, we have this is our first time meeting virtually, so thank you for that perspective as well and, and that PowerPoint. Uh, uh, that was great. Uh, to my my dear friend and former colleague, whom I miss dearly, great to see you, Councillor uh, Emeritus uh, Zakum, and thank you. We're really excited for your new role in this new uh, work that you're going to continue to do. And then finally, uh, Mayor Siddiqui and Councillor Ewan Camp, and um, thank you for sharing. You know, you guys have done some really incredibly important work here and one thing that i really value is that i think we're looking at housing as a regional issue a heck of a lot better than we have quite frankly um and this is a way that we can all sort of have honest and frank and you both had touched upon some of the political challenges that come um with zoning changes uh but also sort of the practical ways to make sure that this works. So I really appreciate learning from you um, and seeing ways that we can we can support one another. Um, you know, as, as somewhat of an anecdote, I remember early on in my uh, time in office, which was uh, quite quite a while ago now, um, we had a, a hearing, former, actually Councilor Zakum's predecessor, Mike Ross, called for a hearing and uh, the Muse Boston's Museum of Science, which, as you know, is mostly in Cambridge, but part of it is in the city of Boston as well. Uh, and that was seen as controversial that we were holding Boston business outside Boston's limits. So it's great to see this 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 uh, regional approach to these important issues. A um, couple questions and I'm just going to sort of pop around. Andy, I'm going to start with you um, and, and sort of in, in full disclosure, there is a lawsuit pending about the project, uh, the Pine Street project. So I totally recognize I'm not going to ask you specifically about that. Um, I have my own opinions, which I've already articulated and will continue to do so. But um, I'm curious, TCB has done projects like this throughout, I think, the Eastern Seaboard, it's safe to say. Um, have you seen, can you just briefly touch upon other challenges or other ways that, that um, maybe, maybe better processes that you've encountered, you, you oversee, I think most of the sort of the, the East Coast TCB projects, certainly the Mid-Atlantic and New England, um, other ways that, uh, has this happened in other cities? Is this something that's sort of uniquely Boston or uniquely greater Boston? Um, or are there safeguards in place so that a, in my opinion, not yours, a frivolous and divisive lawsuit can't derail an otherwise incredibly supported project? I, I would, unfortunately, it's not unique. I mean, unfortunately we have in other places um, encountered certain uh, lawsuits as well. You know, I mean, um, obviously each city, town, state has slightly different laws. And so exactly how it comes about, you know, different zoning processes and all that stuff. So it's hard to say anything universal other than um, there is definitely uh, other places have such things. So it's great that there's this progressive um, view of it all. I think one thing important to say, um, you know, the part of this, one of the discussions earlier, you know, coming back specifically to Boston, I think it's not the, the, I, it's certainly one project per year getting delayed is way too many, but I think it, the, as some people have talked about, it isn't just about allowing those projects to move forward with better zoning. It's also, you know, even if you eventually get the zoning approval, simply having to go through that process can add time uh, and money to a process. So, you know, if, if the, nothing changed about the Article 80 process in Boston and, you know, you went through that, you got your BPDA approval, you have to go through X number of months through a ZBA process. And so if, there, if it was as of right, um, again, I don't know the technicalities of how Article 80 relates to ZBA, but if you, you know, if you got Article 80 approval and then, then you were done with the process at that stage, that would be a huge benefit, not just to the projects that have the, the threat of litigation, but just to allow other projects, uh, all, you know, projects that don't, are lucky enough, which are most, to do, don't have to go through that litigation process, but still it would be a, a big benefit to allow those to go more quickly. No, I, I think that's right. And I'm glad you mentioned or invoked Article 80, uh, Andy, because I think that uh, addresses the sort of hypothetical that Brian Glasscock raised of, you know, what would be the safeguards if a 15 story building would be plopped in a neighborhood? Well, something of that size would still go through the Article 80 process, but this is we're talking about what the zoning relief sort of steps are. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm going to, oh, before I get to the, the mayor and councilor, I, I guess I'll, I'll open up to, to Molly, Jesse, or Josh. Any other thoughts specifically? on, um, I mean, I think you all sort of articulated this well, but as we look to 
make changes at the either the zoning code or the through the zoning commission are there other sort of aspects that we should be cognizant of um going forward or anyone want to sort of jump in on that sure if i can no. briefly uh counselor uh i think you know a lot of it's been said already but the underlying issue is and i i will quote a uh, counselor ewan camp and again uh is that local government needs to remove whatever obstacles that can be to this, whether that's removing opportunities for lawsuits, um, whether it's speeding the review process. And listen, as as I know my former colleagues understand and our colleagues in Cambridge and Somerville, obviously neighborhood residents should and deserve a voice uh, in development projects in their neighborhoods. But that cannot be an ultimate veto, um, particularly when it comes to much needed affordable housing. Creating more affordable housing, denser housing in our communities contributes dramatically to better outcomes around racial and social equity, uh, around reducing carbon emissions, around basic economic development um, for our communities. And it's really critical that we do that. And if there are ways that we can fairly remove these, you've seen in other cities uh, across the country, particularly recently in Oregon, uh, of changing some of their zoning regulations to allow as of right more density. Uh, I'm sure earlier, there was discussion to the Boston indicators report that recently changed came out. This is very much a regional issue, but Boston can and, and should be leading the way. And I also think we're in a place where, you know, there's a more need, there's a dramatic need for this and there's an appetite for making these changes. And I, I urge everyone involved to, to seize that opportunity and, and make some really revolutionary change that will improve our communities for the future. Uh, I would just like to add, Councillor, um, you know, just underscoring some of the elements that I, I did talk about in my comments. You know, I think we have been talking a lot about about process and process is is certainly key for the reasons that many of us have already mentioned. But there are those sort of unsexy elements of zoning um, that even if officially something is by right, um, might render a project infeasible. Right. So things like I mentioned you know, setbacks, lot setbacks, uh, floor area ratios, height restrictions, um, those technical elements of zoning um, that can actually make a project infeasible. So you can say, yeah, go build a four story, you know, 20 unit development, you know, this is just off the top of my head um, on XYZ parcel, uh, and we're gonna allow you to do it by right, but technically you can't fit in those 20 units onto that lot. So, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's critical that that element continue to be a, a part of this conversation because just as much as process can kill a project, um, the zoning requirements or restrictive zoning requirements um, can be uh, can kill a project as well. That's great. Thank, thank you. No, I appreciate that. And let, let me just close because I, I know uh, we've got other counselors to get to and there could be time uh, time constraints, but uh, Mayor Siddiqui and, and Councilor Ewan Campen, um, Obviously, in addition to displacement affordability, we are all feeling in our respective municipalities the high cost of doing construction. Um, there are so many shared issues that I think this could help alleviate. And I'm just curious if I, I think you both touched upon it well, but but before I close out my questions, are there any, you know, we're sort of at the beginning of the process. I think you, uh, both your municipalities have sort of uh, gotten the ball down the, the closer to the field goal, so to speak, and in the end zone. Um, any cautionary sort of words for us as we begin engaging our constituency and working sort of collaboratively that we should be looking at as it relates to uh, as it relates to this. If either of you want to jump on that, no, if I could bump for uh, Mayor Siddiqui to have preference because I know she has oh. to run to another meeting. So um, feel free to add any final words of wisdom for us to your answer to Council O'Malley as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. Uh, you know, I think um, I think I've mentioned what I would maybe. Me, me, uh, expect and caution. I think it'll be, it's a lot of conversation. It's, I think, start with the goals, right? Start with the goals. The goals are um, what it's all about. Uh, and then those details that are, are important, uh, you know, you have to listen um, uh, to people. I think what people, some folks critiqued was that there are some counselors who weren't, who just weren't willing to listen or allege they weren't willing to listen. Uh, and uh, I think people in that way, somewhat felt unheard. And so whatever you can do, you say, look, I hear you, I don't agree with you, uh, but uh, here's where I'm coming from. 
uh, instead of getting to a, a place where it did, as um, Pastor Brock mentioned, it, it was very, um, I don't know the word, but there were a lot of feelings uh, and hard feelings from community members uh, at to, as to what some of the things that were being said, uh, you know, people felt that um, they were being accused of racism, for example. And so, you know, I think there's a way to have these conversations and they're difficult conversations, but uh, anything you can do to um, think about uh, how to uh, disrupt that, uh, it, you know, dis divisiveness during during this, uh, especially during these times, I think there is a way to do that. So I would really recommend uh, thinking about that. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to send some notes uh, along those regards of some of the things that um, I did think that we could have done probably better in conversations with um, community members. But I think overall, there is a way to talk about these things without um, it becoming um, so, so um, divisive. So that's what I would recommend. It will become uncomfortable, but there's a way to do it. And I say always start with the goals. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I would just add to what Mayor Siddiqui said. I, I think it's important to um, to to focus on the big picture, to not get drawn into you know residents' nightmare scenarios that could happen in one-off cases. You know, I don't need to tell any of you the the housing affordability situation in our communities is like a it's like a ratchet. Every year, we are losing the existing affordable housing in our neighborhoods and we are gaining really high-end uh, housing. And if we are serious about wanting these communities to continue to be diverse for working people to be able to live in our communities, we have to, we have to do things like this. And I, I would also say one thing that's been really helpful in Somerville is to, to, um, to, for all of us to get educated about what it takes on the side of the nonprofit developers, because a lot of the questions that I think many of us had um, around um, unit size, around aesthetics of the buildings, things like that, or around energy efficiency. The answer that we, we actually heard from, in, from so many of the nonprofit developers is that those issues are actually very highly regulated by their funding sources in many cases. And so really what was the best approach for the city council to take was often to not, not get involved in, in issues like that because so many these, one of the nonprofit developers memorably described it as we are regulated up the wazoo. You do not need to worry about, um, uh, you know, some of these nightmare scenarios that, that I think trying to over, over prescribe um, things like that will in many cases wind up conflicting with um, funding sources. So I would say, um, you know, this is an incredibly important issue, and uh, I, I'm, I'm really thankful that you all are, are taking it up. Well, we are incredibly thankful to you, uh, you both for uh, sharing your, uh, your great work and expertise. Um, thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor Malley. Councilor Mejia. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you to all the panelists for being here. Um, I really do appreciate your insight and lessons learned and helping us um, do the same and hopefully avoid some of the obstacles along the way. Um, this is just a little bit of a commentary and then I, I do have a quick question. You know, I think it's really interesting that our, in our contracting process, we always give it to the lowest bidder, but when it comes to bidding for land, suddenly we've completely switched our tone in both situations. And so we end up impacting low income people of color and smaller hyper-local businesses and nonprofits. And I think that um, this is definitely something that we need to uh, acknowledge and, and reconcile with somehow, some way, at some point. In terms of questions, um, uh, this is to Molly. I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about your home ownership classes. I know the city offers similar classes. I actually took them, but I'm wondering what we can learn from you to make them more successful. So Austin Brighton CDC is one of the city's partners. So it's basically the same class that you took. Um, I, I think in this context with the zoning overlay, there's not too much that crosses over, but our housing, I'm gonna call it a housing ecosystem 
they're all connected. And when there's missing housing stock in one sector, it will push back into the others. And at the end of the day, the people with the money will outbid the people who don't have money. And so I think it's really important to think about ways for market rate development to be cheaper, for small developers to get involved in projects and um, the same zoning restrictions that are faced by many of the CDCs um, doing bigger, you know, subsidized or mixed uh, income, mixed use development. That's faced by small developers too, but they don't have the same access to, to capital to carry them through that process. Um, furthermore, anytime there's a variance involved, we're opening it up to a lawsuit. So it doesn't matter if there's community support, it doesn't matter anything, like um, the variance opens the door. And so developers seek ways to get stability and avoid that process. So they do smaller projects that cost more. And uh, in the end, I think the first time home buyers lose out every time. Thank you for that. And I'm just curious, and I'm not sure who would be able to answer this question, Councilor Wu, or maybe if even if this question is appropriate in this forum, but I am curious, you know, oftentimes we talk about affordable housing and it always seems like it's a dirty word that we should not be talking about affordable housing. Um, and I'm just curious about um, whether or not when you build affordable housing, does that impact the property value of the surrounding area? Is that why we have such a um, pushback from folks or just they just don't want certain people to live in the neighborhood? Like who is this, I don't know if this is even the right question in this space, but I'm curious as to- You might have something to say. I, I'm happy to address that as an affordable housing developer. I can say absolutely there is no impact on nearby property values. Um, by affordable housing. The affordable housing that we, that the CDCs in Boston, that the community builders, others built is incredibly high quality, incredibly well-managed affordable housing. There is no negative impact on property values. In fact, we also pay taxes um, on affordable housing as well. So um, I know that's a, it's a, it's a line that you often hear from opponents of affordable housing that, that creating um, affordable homes, multifamily buildings uh, will negatively impact their property values. Values, there is no evidence that that has happened at all. Yeah, so I guess, I guess yes, uh, I'm sorry, just because I really want to push back a little bit. Um, that as someone who grew up in Section 8, I do hear that from a lot of folks. There is this belief that because you're low income, you're undesirable, and therefore that's going to impact whether or not people want to live on the block that you are building low income housing in. So that's probably where I'm coming from, but mm -hmm. I just... I'm just curious. Madam, Madam Chair, may I add to that? Um, so Councillor, it's, it's a really important question. And in our research, and it's not certainly groundbreaking research, there's actually been a lot of good, uh, more widespread publicity on these issues recently, is that so much of zoning was initially developed in this country to be racially and economically exclusionary. Um, and while it may not explicitly have that goal in this day and age, the effects are still very much there. So obviously this is about Boston, the city of Boston, which is an incredibly diverse uh, community and we should be building housing for all types of folks, all from all backgrounds. And once you get out of the city and out of Boston, Cambridge and Somerville, it's even more stark, um, sort of the really explicitly exclusionary goals of zoning policy. And you see that every day and the access to educational opportunities, to jobs, um, to good affordable uh, and middle income housing. So it absolutely needs to be addressed. And I think you're hundred percent right uh, to call it out in this forum uh, as it should be, I think in any forum uh, where housing and zoning is being discussed, we need to be more thoughtful about it. Allowing the creation of denser housing in the city uh, and across the state goes a huge way to address some of these issues. Um, and it's time we did that. Yeah. And then I don't know, uh, Chairwoman Wu, if I have opportunity for one more question. Yep, go ahead, Councilor Maria. Okay. Um, and so again, I, I always think about housing as it connects to education. Um, and I think that when we think about affordable housing, and we also think about the quality of education that exists within these neighborhoods, that there is a direct correlation between that. And I'm just curious in terms of zoning, I know this is what this what we're talking about here today, but I just think that there is some 
there's a connection between these two worlds, education and housing. Um, and I don't know, maybe this is some, something you all experts can think about and marinate on, but I just felt like it was important for you to know that I know that there is a connection between housing and education and how it impacts affordable um, units in the city of Boston. I'm gonna just ask if Councilor Ewan Campin wants to respond to that specifically or offer any um, final words because I know he has to jump to another meeting as well. Um, nothing in response to that specifically, but I just wanted to thank you again for having me here. And it was great to see you all and I, I wish you the best on this. Thank you. Anyone else on Councilor Mejia's question? I, I, I will, um, if, if, if that's okay. Um, Councillor Wu, um, uh, Councillor Mejia, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for you, but it, it is certainly something uh, we think about as 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 we up in Abreth Housing um, endeavor to build more family housing in the city of Boston, as we're doing uh, in West Roxbury right now. And, you know, I I think obviously educational policy is is a huge discussion in our city right now, and that goes obviously beyond just zoning. But to some degree, um, even though. Um, we don't have neighborhood schools um, in Boston. Uh, you know, people do make choices about what schools they attend sort of based on where they live, um, even if it's not codified into the way our, our system works. And so, um, you know, that's why one of the comments that I made in my, my comments was about um, making sure we distribute new affordable housing through all neighborhoods uh, of the city. We want to build strong, equitable educational opportunities across the city. We also want to do um, strong, affordable, equitable housing opportunities across the city so that we can sort of marry those, those two uh, policy discussion areas. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And that's all, Councillor Wu. I don't have any more questions for now. Thank you, J Josh. It's good to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Braden is next in the lineup, although I know she had mentioned earlier she had an 1130 hard stop, so I think there's a chance. Councillor Braden, are you there? Okay. Um, and I believe um, Councillor Arroyo and Council President Janie were going to defer their questions this round as well. So um, back to our, our lead sponsor, Councillor Bach, for her second round. Thank you for deferring earlier. No, that's fine. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I, I think a lot's been said. Um, I think that uh, I, one thing I'll flag that's sort of different about the Cambridge and um, Somerville approaches is that Cambridge, um, well, they both did it across the city, but because of that new zoning that um, Ben mentioned that's come in in Somerville, it's transit oriented, that new zoning. And so therefore also these like zones of permission are become transit oriented. And I think that's like something for us to discuss as a city on the one hand, what's appealing about that is acknowledging how central, you know, transit is to living in the city, um, especially, I mean, especially as a low and moderate income person, although frankly, all walks of life use the T um, and that's the conversation that we're having very robustly right now um, with some terrible cuts recommended. Um, but I think that, uh, I think that there's an advantage to acknowledging that it's particularly great to put affordable housing close to transit. On the other hand, I think what Jesse said is really important about, um, about us having affordable housing in all parts of the city and what Josh said about the fact that historically there are areas of historic exclusion through zoning that have been designed to keep people of all walks of life out of certain parts of the city. Um, and we're actually trying to push back against that with our fair housing zoning um, work um, with, uh, under the leadership of Councilor Edwards. So I, I just think in a city like Boston, where frankly, the whole city is pretty transit accessible compared to many other parts of the state and country, um, you know, we want to make sure that uh, anything that we do will really open up the possibility of this affordable housing in all um, quarters. And uh, and so I would have asked I would have asked Ben about that decision, but he's had to jump. Um, so I think uh, I'll just the one other comment I would lodge is that um, you know I was still working at the BHA when the Pine Street uh, Community Builders project uh, was under discussion. Um, and it was a big deal that the housing authority was able to get sort of 80 odd project based vouchers to help make deeply affordable um, units happen. And I think to the mayor's point, Mayor Siddiqui's point, like, I don't think people understand when we talk about getting deeply affordable housing, the number of resources and the ways that the stars have to align to make that possible. Um, and I think that the idea that we would get the amount of supportive housing resources that Pine Street is marshaled for that building 
and the number of deeply affordable product-based vouchers that the BHA has marshaled, marshaled and all of the acumen that TCV has brought to the table and that then we would be in a situation where the project isn't going forward. I think it's just like, I think there's a degree of invisibility of how many resources are being held up there um, that we really need we really need to understand um, and remove obstacles to. Um, and my final note would be something that Councillor Wu often raises. I think our existing zoning system creates real arbitrage in terms of land value, like people who think, reckon that they can get something permitted versus people who aren't sure, right? The former category of person, the land is worth more to them and so they can bid more. Um, and it's, uh, it's really um, not a great system from the perspective of transparency and consistency. I think that having some rules across the board that gave affordable housing developers a level of confidence about what they were gonna be able to get permitted would be both good for our goals of proposing a form of sorry, proposing affordable housing and would also um, be really good for kind of a level of equity across the board of access to, to that kind of development work. Um, so it's something I just wanna flag, uh, this has turned into a comment rather than a second round of questions. Um, I just wanna flag that it's certainly something um, that uh, my office is uh, looking to sort of move into an ordinance conversation in the new year. Um, and I really appreciate all the colleagues joining today and everybody um, all the all the expertise on the advocate um, and adjacent community side uh, coming to the table. So thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to my colleague, Councillor O'Malley. Thank you. Do any of the panelists want to respond to that or offer any final comment? And then I'll kick it over to Councillor O'Malley for closing statement as well. Just say, I, I agree wholeheartedly uh, with uh, my successor as District 8 City Councilor. Um, and, and before we close, I know um, in the interest of time, I'll be very brief here, is that I think Molly was mentioning uh, this earlier in response to one of uh, Councilor Mejia's comments is that we need to also be thinking about the entire housing ecosystem and what affordable means. Um, you know, Councilor Bach was talking about deeply affordable, subsidized, deed restricted housing, which is of critical need. Uh, in the city of Boston and, and really across the Commonwealth. But another important piece of the puzzle though, is allowing you know, smaller developers, even, even for-profit developers to get through this process um, a little quicker uh, and a little less, in a little less of a costly manner because a lot of those projects that they're being built are the middle income housing stock uh, that is the city of Boston needs. You know, if we, if we have these unpredictable zoning processes, if we you know, require folks to go through years long permitting and then be subject to lawsuits, it just dramatically raises the cost. So when we think about this, let's think about the big, all affordable projects for sure, but also thinking about some which may be technically market rate, but are the types of housing uh, that are more accessible to people at middle uh, and lower incomes in the city of Boston. And with that, I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to join you all today uh, to share some, some of my thoughts and uh, the positions of Housing Forward Massachusetts and look forward to continuing our work on this project, on this project, on these goals and being helpful in any way that we can. Thank you. Any other panelists? Everyone good? Okay, um, then let's do um, Councillor O'Malley, then Councillor Mejia, and then if Councillor Bach wants to add anything at the end, and then we will wrap. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and th thank you, everybody. Um, first and foremost, thank you to my dear colleague and friend, Councillor Bach, who not only is a leader and uh, gets into the 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 uh, weeds, so to speak, of of great important details, but also correctly uses words like arbitrage when talking about uh, the uh, complexity that's before us. It's it's why there are big shoes left to fill by Councillor Zakum, Councillor Bach, but you are filling them uh, wonderfully. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, obviously, I, I look forward to continuing the partnership with with uh, with Councillor Bach and everyone on this Zoom call and others uh, in the new year ahead. It will be so uh, just um, among countless other reasons why I am looking forward to January 20th of 2021 is to have a president who will no longer use housing, among other things, as a divisive uh, racist, we can't even say dog whistle anywhere, dog bullhorn, um, to uh, divide people. Uh, we actually have a president-elect who recognizes the, the need and the dignity uh, for housing, for affordable housing. So looking forward to working uh, with Councillor Bach as it as it relates to sort of looking at, at, at an ordinance, looking at some changes. I would also say that, you know, this is somewhat of a larger issue 
but I think it's relevant to what we're discussing today. As we talk about sort of city changes, Bob, I'm talking about Boston specifically to our uh, to our city charters. We talk about empowering our legislative body, this body, to do more and be more of a, a counterbalance uh, to the mayor, um, allowing for more um, seamless uh, oversight of the zoning code is something that has to be discussed. I had referenced in my first round of questions uh, about the JP Rocks corridor study. This was something that was an incredibly arduous, long, laborious process, but I stand by the recommendations wholeheartedly, and we have used it um, with some success to shape much of the development along the corridor from Forest Hills to Eggleston Square. Um, it's been sitting before the Zoning Commission now for, for a number of years. Uh, I understand that it's not a perfect uh, plan, and we certainly have some added um, uh, concerns around it, but this is something that we should have, because of, in my opinion, should have been adopted by the Zoning Commission, if nothing else more than for predictability and for having one set of rules for would-be developers, which also incentivizes building more and deep, more deeply affordable units. Uh, similarly, you know, there are other Zoning Commission changes that this body and that I helped write as it relates to, um, as it relates to environmental policy. I'm speaking specifically about a quarry in West Roxbury, uh, which sought to accept RCS level two, which is for your layman's parlance, uh, dirty dirt, environmentally, uh, you know, detrimental uh, fill. Um, and it was never prohibited from the zoning code, not because it was seen as an allowed or a good thing, but simply because it's such a rare, unique thing. So we wrote a zoning code amendment, which still hasn't been acted upon. This is going now probably five or six years. So the point I'm trying to make in closing is that there is work that we can do and we must do as it relates to different ordinances and guidelines, but I'm also hopeful that this will continue the conversation and maybe help bring some closure to the conversation that would allow the council to play as the directed representatives of the citizens of Boston to play a larger role in having oversight in terms of the zoning code, in terms of what we need to do in the zoning commission and different rules and promulgations that we seek to see adopted. Um, ladies, gentlemen, it's been a very long morning, but a very, uh, wonderful morning. We've talked about a lot of important issues. We've learned uh, from each other and uh, the work will continue. And I'm just incredibly grateful for our partners in government and our partners in the private sector, particularly the housing sector, who've been um, great allies in this. And uh, the work uh, continues. Uh, we're going to get this done. So thank you all. Thank you, Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Um, thank you, Chairwoman Wu. Um, and Councilor O'Malley and Kenzie ba and Councilor Bach for bringing all of us together today. Um, you know, and all of the panelists that were here really do appreciate your insight and perspective. Um, I feel in many ways that, um, you know, I'm happy to be in this position because I'm learning a lot about why we haven't been able to move the needle in so many different spaces. Um, we talk about affordable housing and then you participate in hearings like this and then you realize, oh my God, we can't build affordable because there's 500 layers of laws that prevent us from moving the work. And I think that this is what's so frustrating for a lot of advocates and people who are living the realities is because we feel we get a lot of lip service, but it's not really lip service. What it is is just there's very little um, oftentimes we lack the political will and courage to move beyond these conversations and say, you know what, the buck stops here, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. And we should not have countless conversations about the same thing. We should just get to the point where it's like, Councilor Bach, go ahead and write that ordinance. Let's get that working session up and running. Let's get you know the community engaged. People need to put their differences aside and let's just get to the business at hand. Because if we don't act with a sense of urgency, most of the people who are living in the city of Boston are gonna end up in Brockton, which already they are moving to Brockton, Randolph. And it's like just displacement is crazy here in the city of Boston. And it's we're getting to the point where we're gonna have to start taxing the city of Boston for every, every person that gets um, kicked out, right? <laughs> because either we're, gonna, either we're gonna have to do something about the situation or we're gonna have to start hitting our own pockets. And I know that's crazy talk, but I'm just telling you all that people are just frustrated out in these streets. And so I'm really excited that you all are here and, and we're having this conversation, but we need to move beyond these dialogues and show people 
that we're ready to roll up our sleeves and do the business of the people. And I'm looking forward to doing this alongside each and every one of you. And thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Okay, last word to Councilor Bach. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I, I gave my closing comments uh, at the top. And so just really grateful to everyone's participation. And I couldn't second Councilor Mejia more strongly. I think we, the, the things that are in our power um, that are just operating every day to slow down the urgent work of uh, this city and of making this a city for all are things that we just have to move with, a, with lots of speed on. So I think, and I think this is one of them. So looking forward to it in the new year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And thank you to everyone, again, especially our lead sponsors, Councillor Bach and Councillor O'Malley, to all of our panelists from the administration, from community, to the pleasure of seeing colleagues from outside the city and our, our former colleagues. Um, thank you, everyone. This will conclude today's hearing on docket 0941. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, all. Thank you. You have to gabble us, gabble us. I just have an apple and a pen. <laughs> <laughs> gabble away. <laughs> Thank you. Right, see y'all. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Welcome. Have a good day.